Thank you very much for the invitation to speak in this seminar. Yeah, I'm based in uh, Paris, in Sorbonne Université, and I will be talking about the master relation that simplifies maps and free schemas. This is partially based on joint work with uh, Guy Tamborot, Severin Charbonnier, Felix Light, and, and Sergei Shalvin in this work over here. Um, but I will also be talking a lot about the origins of this uh, problem, how we got to this master relation that is now kind of universal. And you will see those other works appearing in the talk. So, we, so yeah, what I want to present today is uh, a triple duality. So it's a duality that now we say universal. We don't know still how universal, but it appears in three very different contexts um, that are related to each other. And uh, so it's kind of, you can see every uh, instance of this context, context as, a, as an incarnation of this uh, master relation. So let me start introducing these different contexts and you will get a flavor of uh, what is this duality about. So the first uh, of them is free probability. Um, I don't know how many people will are familiar with free probability here. I guess if you're familiar, you will see more motivation in some things, but if not, it's not a problem. So let me just say that free probability just replaces the uh, classical notion of independence by a notion of freeness that is uh, especially suitable to study non-commutative uh, random variables. Um, so yeah, this is uh, the basic idea. Then uh, in free probability, you consider certain moments and certain objects that measure your freeness that are called free cumulants. Then uh, in the context of combinatorics, the moments can correspond sometimes to certain maps. Maps, I mean graphs embedded on surfaces. And what corresponds to free cumulants in that case, then it's fully simple maps. And then there is the world of topological regression that is maybe the farthest for, uh, for this audience. So I will introduce it, uh, introduce it briefly here. It's not, necessary, it's not necessary to know anything about this, um, but yeah, I will introduce it briefly so you know at least what I'm talking about uh, when, I, when I say spectral curve and these type of things. So topological regression, it takes some input data. This input data, we call it spectral curve. And it consists of a Riemann surface, sigma, then two meromorphic functions on it, x and y. And then we form a one form with x and y, like this, and then a B differential omega zero two. Uh, usually the one form and the B differential, they have to do with a certain uh, geometric problem or topological problem. And uh, it has to do with the, that problem in topology zero one, and that means the topology of the disk. So it's zero zero one boundary. And omega zero two usually has to do with the topology of cylinders. So it's zero zero two boundaries. And then topological recursion produces for you a family of multi-differentials for any G and N that usually uh, solve a certain problem that was initiated with the zero one and zero two um, that is important in, in geometry or in different, in different fields. And this topological recursion is a recursion on 2g minus 2 plus n. That is why it's called topological recursion. So yeah, maybe the most uh, amazing feature of topological recursion is that it appears in many different contexts, in uh, models of statistical physics, um, in uh, algebraic geometry, in intersection numbers over the modular space of curves, uh, enumerations of uh, maps, this type of uh, different worlds. And the same universal formula works in every case. Usually, I mean, of course, there are many variations afterwards. Here I'm presenting the, the simplest case. And then what is this duality in the setting of topological recursion? So if you have a spectral curve, I will be calling spectral curves just a pair X and Y, but it's given by all this. So I'm hiding a bit of information. You apply topological recursion. And then you can apply a symplectic transformation to this X and Y. It just means some transformation that transforms X and Y in such a way that you preserve the, the symplectic form. Then on the other side, you apply topological recursion. What uh, symplectic invariance of topological recursion tells us is that some relation is expected between these two sides. You will see a bit more details later. So this side, if this side corresponds to maps, for example, this side we know now that if you take the particular 
symplectic transformation in which you extend x and y, which is the most complicated one to understand, then uh, these will correspond to fully simple maps. So these are the three incarnations of the duality. Now I will continue with these um, three manifestations of this duality and explain a bit the history of how we arrived till we, we are where we are today. So in 2017, uh, together with Guy Tamboreau, we um, established a connection between free probability, just meaning that if you take certain moments that are generating series of maps, so graphs embedded on surfaces without uh, any more decorations, um, the free cumulants will correspond to something that we introduced uh, in this uh, work that is called fully simple maps. Okay, then we wanted to also try to uh, get the relation with the topological recursion extent of X and Y, but this we couldn't uh, give a complete uh, proof at the time. So it was just a conjecture. So these arrows were still conjectural. And then there were some hints already in some old papers that there could be some relation between free probability and Horvitz numbers. Um, but we actually found, and this we were not expecting, that these two problems, maps in fully simple maps, they are related through monotone Horvitz numbers. And uh, this we were not expecting, so it was quite nice. We proved it using uh, matrix models and it made the problem more interesting. And then in 2019, uh, together with uh, Severin Charbonnier and Norman Do as well, we also gave a combinatorial proof of this relation. You will see a bit more of these details later. This combinatorial proof led this team of people, uh, Bitskov, Dunin, Barkovsky, Kazarian, and Sheldin, uh, to a proof of the topological recursion for fully simple maps with the extent spectral curve with respect to maps. And uh, we also produced a proof actually completely independently. Um, and the proof is completely different that just relies on some combinatorics of some other works that we had produced before. Then uh, with this, we established the, these other connections. And then what we did more recently, and it's kind of the, the most universal arrow is uh, this one. And this is the, maybe the work that I will be focusing on on the second part of the talk. Um, so now we know that the relation between moments and free cumulants, completely in general, also in higher orders, is given by this uh, relation through monotone Horvitz numbers. And it turns out that this relation through monotone Horvitz numbers, it relates to maps and fully simple maps, but you can also formulate it completely in general. And in particular, it produces all relations between moments and free cumulants. Okay. So let me start by introducing this uh, master relation that gives us uh, this duality. So to introduce the duality, I first have to define what are uh, Horvitz numbers. So they are just counting coverings of the sphere with certain restrictions. This is the idea of Horvitz numbers. Then you see here, I take two partitions of a certain non-negative integer D. I also take K another non-negative integer. So what are these indicating? Uh, <clears throat> the first partition, uh, lambda, is telling us how the sheets of the covering come together at each of the pre-images of zero. So here we imagine this is the Riemann sphere. We are counting coverings and we want to specify this ramification profile with lambda. And then over infinity, mu tells us how the sheets come together. And then k tells us how many other um, simple ramification points are there in the middle. So we consider these two special points which have ramification profiles uh, given by the partitions. And we also have k other ramification points, but in which only two sheets can come together. Okay. Um, and then this is counted with some automorphism factor that I will not give details about. But I want to give another way of uh, um, enumerating these Horvitz numbers through the symmetric group, because this will help us define monotone for with numbers. And also because it's kind of beautiful, the relation between counting these geometric objects and counting these top tuples in the symmetric group. Okay, so if we consider C lambda, a conjugacy class in the symmetric group uh, on N elements of cycle type, of elements of cycle type given by lambda. So we know that lambda um, uh, specifies the conjugacy class. This just tell, lambda, lambda just tells us um, 
the lengths of the cycles of the permutation. Then we can see that uh, double monotone Hurwitz numbers are also counted as one over d factorial times the number of tuples where sigma, the first one is of cycle type given by lambda. And then the other k are given of cycle type two, one, 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 one. So they are transpositions. And then the product is just of cycle type mu. So, okay, now if we take the transposition written like this, in which uh, a i is uh, strictly smaller than b i, if the b's form a weakly monotone increasing sequence, then the Horvitz numbers are called weakly monotone. If the sequence is strictly increasing, then the Horvitz numbers are called strictly monotone Horvitz numbers. Okay, and here we consider just the generating series, two little comments since that, uh, well, this one is actually a polynomial and this one is a series. But in this one, an important thing is that there is a sign that will be hidden when we use this notation, but it's, uh, it's uh, useful to, to make the formulas nicer. Okay, so now uh, I'm ready to give you the definition of this master relation. But before I want to talk about what I call topological partition function in general. So many people in this audience imagine what a partition function is. For me, it's just something very generic. So I consider the Fox space as the completion of the ring of symmetric polynomials. So just this guy with coefficients in H bar. So we consider this type of uh, object. Then we also consider P lambda, where lambda is just a partition or a young diagram. And it, this is just a notation to denote uh, this product of P i's, where i's are the parts of the partition. Then we consider this uh, combinatorial factor. So this is just uh, a product of the parts of the partition times product of the fa of factorials of multiplicities uh, in the partition. Then what I call topological partition function is uh, just a generating series of this shape. So we just encode some numbers in there. It has a topological expansion. So this is usually has to do with some genus. Then we take uh, the exponential of it like this. We can expand this exponential. And then if we take just the coefficient of all the p's and h to a certain power of what corresponds to a certain fixed lambda, then this part over here, we just call it z lambda. Okay, now we have uh, uh, that this z lambda can be related to another z check through the master relation if this satisfies this, uh, if they are related through this uh, specific relation here. So z lambda can be written as this, um, this um, combinatorial factor uh, times the sum over partitions of the same number partitioned by lambda. And here we take monotone Hurwitz numbers with two uh, partitions here, uh, lambda for this one and mu for this one and then times the other topological partition function. So we say that these two topological partition functions are related through the master relation. And once you have this master relation, you can write it in an equivalent way. So you can actually invert this relation like this. So here now you can express this guy in, in terms of the other. And what appears as coefficients are weakly monotone Hurwitz numbers. This uh, equivalence is quite easy if you know things about these Hurwitz numbers. So once you have one, you have also the other for free. So now um, I just want to tell you this is a bit, uh, this part is a bit vague because it's the introduction, but uh, I just want to tell you that topological partition functions encode some information, they, they encode some numbers. They, this uh, information can also be encoded on something that we call multiplicative functions on partition permutations. Okay, this you don't know what it is yet, but it can also be encoded in, into correlators or endpoint functions. This is a bit less mysterious, so you just define it like this. So open problem in free probability, if you have certain guys here and in free probability, the only thing they cared about so far is uh, geno zero. What we did in this work also is establishing a, a theory of free probability in which we include higher genus corrections. But classically, they only cared about geno zero. So if you put here moments and uh, here the, the corresponding thing, the, they will be um, free cumulants. What are the moment cumulant relations between the correlators? 
So this was known for one and two. Then we also proved it using uh, certain combinatorics for n equal to three using topological recursion. But for n greater than three, this was an open problem. This is what we solved in this la last work that I was talking about. And the strategy is just the following. This is a bit abstract, but okay. At least I hope you can get the idea. You have our master relation between two topological partition functions. And we show that this is equivalent to a relation through some convolution um, of uh, between multiplicative functions associated to these topological partition functions. And this is usually how you define free cumulants in, in free probability with a thing like this. That's why we show this, this uh, equivalence. On the other side, they were interested in understanding the moment cumulant relation. So we also showed that this is equivalent to certain uh, relations between the correlators. And then we can deduce that uh, uh, these uh, two relations are also equivalent. So we showed the moment cumulant relations in general in free probability. Okay, this is a bit the idea. Uh, can, uh, can, I, can, I, can I have a question? Yeah, sure. So, so this, uh, so you are saying that this open question is is uh, only on the sphere, right? It's only for genius zero, right? Yes. So, and in in free probability, the question was about genius zero. So this question, so okay, let's say in the case n equal to three, is this an identity between two functions, and every function is a, is a, like a three variable function, like just the length of the loop? It just a length yes. of the boundary. Yes, yes, exactly. So you have identity between like a function on the boundary length and you currently know n equal to one to three, but not for n bigger than three. Exactly, yes. Okay. So, I mean, the story is a bit uh, more complicated. So in, in free probability, they managed to prove it for n equal to one and two, geno zero. Yeah. Uh -huh. In combinatorics, we managed to also prove it for n equal to one and two, geno zero. Then mm -hmm. topological recursion gives you, when we got the topological recursion part, uh -huh. we, it gives you for free n equal to three. So if you want that is still related to maps, uh -huh. but, but, but in but free probability uh, they uh, cared about uh, any n and geno uh, zero. But the topological recursion does not give n equal to four? Um, no, it doesn't. So no. is this the intrinsic difficulty for this method or it's more like a, currently it doesn't, but maybe eventually it will. Is the, Yes, it could give it someday. So the, the thing is that uh, with topological recursion, you have a recursive way to compute these guys now, uh -huh. which is nice. Uh -huh. And you also uh -huh. have a recursive way to compute these guys. Uh -huh. But the relations that you find between one problem and the other are not um, as explicit uh -huh. from uh -huh. topological recursion. Because in topological recursion, you have these residues. Uh -huh. And then the formulas, the functional formulas are not really explicit. So okay. you need other tools to find the, the functional relations. It could be that at some point uh, people develop uh, some kind of, uh, so for example, one of our conjectures is that now our universal duality that we call it given by something like this. Now mm -hmm. we know it's equivalent to these relations. Mm -hmm. What is exactly the relation in general to topological recursion is not clear, but mm -hmm. we have a conjecture saying that uh, it's quite general. So this, mm -hmm. would be, this would give a mechanism that uh, if you prove topological recursion, you can have for free the moment cumulant relations. Okay. But it doesn't exist yet. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, so now I want to go a bit to the origins of this master relation, because I was uh, giving you some hints of what is happening nowadays, but it was, uh, this was some years of, uh, of uh, research. So I want to tell you a bit how it started and how it relates to other things. So here I will start with uh, maps, with combinatorial maps. I guess uh, many people have heard about them, but I will uh, start from zero. So a map of genus G and N boundaries is just a connected graph embedded into a closed oriented surface of genus G in such a way that the complement of the graph is homeomorphic to a disjoint union of open disks. These open disks is what we call faces. And uh, okay, so map of genus G because it's um, embedded on a, on a surface of genus G. But what are the boundaries? The boundaries are just N distinguished faces. And how do we distinguish them? Okay, and I count these objects. I want to consider these objects up to some isomorphism that I don't, uh, don't give details about. 
But uh, yeah, let me give some examples and uh, let's try to understand what are these distinguished phases exactly. So here we have a map of topology one, two, because it has genus one, it's drawn on a surface of genus one, and it has two boundaries, meaning that it has two distinguished phases. So there are these two phases and how do we distinguish them? We just draw an arrow on an edge around the phase that we want to distinguish with some convention, like for example, we can take the convention that the distinguished phase will be on the left of this root. And here the same. So, okay, this is a map of topology one, two. Now we can wonder, are these two guys maps? And uh, this one is not because this gray face is not of the topology of the disk. So it's not okay. This one, we can consider it drawn on the sphere. Again, the gray face is not of the topology of the disk. So these are not maps. But if we add some uh, edges, then they are perfectly okay maps. Okay, so this is kind of classical type of maps. Now I want to introduce the special type that we relate to free cumulants that are called fully simple maps. Okay, so what is simple? Simple just means that the boundaries, so the special faces are simple polygons. So for example, here, we just have this triangle and this quadrangle, they are simple. So this is a simple map. But here, this green uh, boundary is not simple. So why exactly? So because we here we go around the, the marked face, which is the green one. So we enter this vertex, we go out, and then we continue and we will enter again this vertex and we go out. So when this happens that you go around the face and you have to enter more than once, it's when you say that the boundary is not simple. So this map is not simple. This map is simple, but it's not fully simple because the two boundaries are touching. And for it to be fully simple, we want that the boundaries are disjoint. So this is simple, but not fully simple. And this one is simple and also fully simple because it doesn't, the boundaries don't touch each other. Okay. So now uh, I will just consider generating series of these objects. Um, so generating series of maps is just a sum over possible maps of a fixed topology and fixed boundary lengths. So we fix the lengths of the boundaries. So what do I mean by this? Here, the length of this green boundary is just three because it's a triangle. Here, the length is just four. So this is what I mean. And then I just take products over internal faces of the map. And then I take certain TKs. So they, I just take products of TKs. So NK is just the length of the internal phase. What does this mean? For example, that if I have a um, T3 to the four, I take the coefficient of this T3 to the four, because this is a formal variable. And it just means that there are those numbers of uh, maps with uh, three, sorry, with four triangles because it's a T3, so it's uh, triangles, because the three tells us about the length of the internal phase, and four is because there are four triangles. Okay, and then we do exactly the same for fully simple maps, just the sum is over fully simple maps, so there are a bit less. Now I want to give the relation with the one Hermitian matrix model. This is a classical relation, so sorry if this is a bit boring for some people, um, but this is classical for maps, for ordinary maps. But for fully simple maps, we introduced certain new correlators to give this relation to Hermitian matrices. So here we take Hn, the space of uh, n times n Hermitian matrices, or the set of uh, n times n Hermitian matrices. We take uh, V to be a potential of this shape. So this will give us a uh, Gaussian behavior. And this is something that usually it will be polynomial, so usually it will stop that we add here and it contains these TKs that have to do with internal phases. And then we consider the unitary invariant measure given by this. And uh, we are interested in computing the moments and classical cumulants of traces of powers of M. This is a classical thing that will have to do with ordinary maps. But now we want to introduce new correlators and classical cumulants of certain expressions. So how do we do this? We take a cycle in the symmetric group on n elements. And we take products of matrix entries that go along these cycles. So these products will be of the shape M, I, J, M, J, K, and like this. So it will be of the same shape of the uh, terms that appear in when you expand the trace. 
But in this case, uh, note that the um, indices will never repeat because we are taking a cycle and cycles, you cannot have uh, repeated elements in the cycle. This on one side. And then we actually take n of these cycles and we want to take them pairwise disjoint so the indices will never repeat. And uh, we take products of all these guys and this will be the correlators that will correspond to fully simple. So uh, first relation to free probability. In free probability, you can sometimes take these guys at certain moments. So okay, you take the limit when the size of the matrices goes to infinity, you have to multiply by, the, by this. So because this is all planar, here we are considering uh, zero zero. And then the free cumulants that uh, correspond to these moments are just given by these quantities. This is actually not how they were defined and not how they were found in the free probability literature, but we could prove that uh, what they found is uh, equal to our formula with, uh, with our expressions here. Oh, sorry, it's a bit dark here. Um, yes, so okay, so we proved uh, this equality. Then uh, what is the relation to maps? Uh, as I was saying, this is the classical result that classical cumulants of traces of powers of M are generating series of maps. This is the classical result of uh, Brezin, Itzik, Tom, Paris, Gis, Over, uh, from 78. And then it was used in many different contexts. And we proved uh, with uh, Gaetan, we introduced this uh, piece and we proved that this corresponds to a generating series of fully simple maps. If you understand this relation very well, maybe you understand why here you just produce fully simple maps. It's because of this condition in, in which the indices never repeat. But okay, I don't want to enter into those details. If you don't know about it, it's not a problem. So let me say that with uh, this, here we are giving the relation uh, between maps and free probability via matrix models. And this relation is uh, quite general, um, but not completely general. If you want to go to, for example, any unitary invariant measure, then you need to consider multitracial Hermitian measures. So this, uh, in this case, I, I just took uh, one, but you can go to multitracial. And then you need to generalize also the maps to something called stuffed maps. But okay, let me not enter into those details either. Um, can I have a question? Yeah. Uh, so in these two uh, identities, are they a uh, formal power series or are they convergent uh, uh, theories, uh, series? This is a very good question. They are a formal power series. Nothing is convergent here. Are they a formal power series? They are formal power right. series. Yes, exactly. Okay, this, so and then, okay, and, and then these uh, boundary length, they are fixed numbers. They are not growing with n, right? So you have this d equal to the summation of this length. Um, exactly. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly. Yeah, mm, I guess you could also study some analytic properties of these matrix models, but this is not what we do here. We treat them kind of a combinatorial tool. Okay. They are formal yeah. um, um, matrix models. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we managed to go from maps to free probability. Maps are related to moments, maps of genus zero, and fully simple maps of genus zero are related to cumulants. Now, okay, in maps and fully simple maps, for us, from the topological recursion point of view, at least, it's very, very natural to consider higher genus as well. So, okay, here you have the first hint that maybe introducing some genus corrections in free probability is an interesting thing. But it was still not clear if introducing these corrections would have the, like, the nice properties, what would be the right notion of uh, higher genus corrections for the uh, uh, free cumulants, exactly. Uh, in general, I mean, because in this case it's clear. Um, and this is what was achieved through this um, uh, master relation. Okay, so let me talk about the origin of this master relation. How did we find it? What was the first instance? The first instance was a relation between ordinary maps and fully simple maps. Here, this black dot just means that I'm taking generating series of possibly disconnected maps. Boundary lengths are fixed by lambda. And uh, we consider in the generating series now a weight n to the Euler characteristic of the map because we are considering disconnected maps, so it's more convenient. So we actually found first number one uh, in the context of matrix models. So what we did, this, uh, this was in, the, in 2017 with Gaetan Bo, is now 
we can express the generating series of fully simple maps using this correlator from matrix models. This, what is inside the correlator is not unitary invariant. The traces are, but these guys are not. But the measure is unitary invariant. And actually this proof, you can generalize it to any unitary invariant measure. You don't care about maps. But okay, here I'm doing it just for maps. And uh, since the measure is unitary invariant, you can take the average over the unitary group. And then you can use these tools coming from, uh, I mean, called uh, Vanguard and Calculus that gives you some tools to compute integrals over the unitary invariant group. Uh, well, and of course you expect to be able to um, express anything that is unitary invariant in terms of the traces, because the traces are kind of the building blocks of anything that is unitary invariant. So uh, that's what we did. We pushed the computation and what we were not expecting when we started the computation is that the coefficients actually are these very interesting things that are um, weakly monotone Horvitz numbers. Okay, once we had this relation, as I was mentioning before, you can have for free this relation. It's kind of the dual relation. And the important thing of this relation with respect to this one is that in here, there are no signs. There are no alternating signs because here, remember, there is an, a sign that is hidden in the generating series. Here, there are no signs. So since there are no signs and everything is really combinatorial, we thought, okay, there should be some combinatorial proof of this. And actually we found two also kind of independently. This was a work in which we put um, two independent proofs together because we discovered that we were working, we had found different proofs for the same thing, um, but they are kind of independent. One is using bijective combinatorics. And this is what I explained in the next slide, but I will skip this because otherwise this will be too long. This could be maybe for questions if people are interested on that. But I want to talk a bit about uh, the relation to topological recursion. So let me come back to this symplectic invariance. Here I start from a spectral curve. I apply a topological recursion. I get some omega GNs. In particular, for n equal to zero, I get certain numbers. I mean, they can depend on parameters as well sometimes, but in general, they are numbers and these are functions of these uh, n variables. Here you apply a transformation that preserves these two forms, so a symplectic transformation. You apply the topological recursion again. What symplectic invariance tells us is that in principle, these numbers should be equal. They are equal for many symplectic transformations, but it's still, I mean, there are for sure corrections when uh, you extend X and Y, and these corrections are not very well understood. We were hoping to shed some light on those and we understood some things but it's still not completely understood. But okay, you can understand some things with um, uh, finding a combinatorial uh, interpretation of these symplectic invariants. And this is what we did. This, is one, what, what, this was one of our motivations to consider these fully simple maps. Okay, so on one side, it's a kind of classical in topological recursion that if you take a certain spectral curve, so given by this X, I will not give many details, but Y is just the generating series of disks, ordinary disks. Uh, omega zero two, you have to prove that cylinders are of a certain type. You can prove this and I skip those details, but you apply the topological recursion and you get generating series of maps of any topology GN. What happens on the other side? What happens if you extend X and Y? And well, this was a conjecture for some time that uh, what you uh, find are fully simple maps. This was proved uh, by, uh, together with Gaetan Bogo and Saran Charbonia using something called ciliated maps. This I will not talk at all about today. Um, and these other people, as I mentioned before, they gave another proof using Fox space formalism. Okay, so this is the relation to topological recursion. Now that I talked a bit about the origins, I want to explain a bit about uh, this surfaced free probability. For that, I have to start telling you a bit about this higher order free probability. Okay, this will be a bit, uh, I will not have time to give many details, but I hope at least you can get the idea of how this works. So in this paper over here, 2006, Collins, Mingo, Schniadi, Speicher, they were experts on free probability and they introduced higher order free cumulants and hence higher order freeness. And actually they managed to study very well second order freeness. They managed to prove uh, 
that it has many nice properties. So it satisfies the R transform machinery. It, uh, well, it behaves very well. But for higher ends, they were not able to prove much, but they still defined it in this paper. And the way to go to higher order is to consider these partitioned permutations. So, okay, this just considers of a set partition and a permutation. So this is a set partition and this is a permutation. And we want the condition that the partition is bigger than the partition associated to the permutation. This just means to just take a partition in which uh, the parts are given by the cycles of uh, gamma. And of course you forget the order of the cycles. And uh, this, is, uh, this condition is better understood with an example. So here you can see we have this block. This block contains these two cycles over here. And this other block contains this cycle and the, and the cycle nine that I didn't write. Um, so this is what I mean by being bigger. We could not have a, here a permutation in which uh, one cycle is four, five, six. This would not work. You don't have this, uh, this inequality then. Okay, then you consider certain, con uh, certain um, concept of uh, length, certain notion of length, and uh, that is defined like this. D plus the number of cycles of the permutation minus two, the number of blocks of the partition. And this is always bigger or equal than zero. You can check, uh, I will not do the details, but we can check together that for the most degenerate case, you get a zero. And then for the others, it will be bigger than zero. So the most degenerate case is just the trivial partition and the trivial, sorry, the trivial um, permutation and the trivial partition in which uh, every uh, block has a size one. So in that case, we have D plus number of cycles is D minus two number of blocks is D. So this is equal to zero. Okay, then you consider a product on these partitioned permutations. Um, so the product just works like this. You take the join of the two partitions. The join is the smallest, um, the smallest possible because this, this forms a posit. So there is a, there is a certain order. So this is the smallest possible partition that contains U and V at the same time, contains in the sense that I explained a bit with the example. And then for the permutations, you just take the product. And you will take this equal to the, the product equal to this, just if this condition over here uh, with respect to the length is satisfied. This is not said in their paper, but this turns out to be a planarity condition. So what we do in our work is we remove this condition, things match very well, and you can introduce a notion of genus. But in this case, you just impose that it's zero otherwise. Okay, then you take convolutions on this partition permutation. So you take two functions. The convolution will be the sum over all possible uh, products of partition permutations that uh, when you multiply them, they give you the, the one that you're applying it to. And then you take products of these functions evaluated in, those two, in these two factors. This is the convolution. And then you have certain special functions. So the delta one is like the most trivial one. It's just one if the partition permutation is this degenerate one that I explained here. Then there is the zeta function. And this one is one if the partition is exactly given by by taking the permutation and forgetting the order of the cycles. If not, it is zero. And one can prove that there exists a unique inverse uh, with respect to the convolution of this zeta in such a way that mu times uh, zeta times uh, with this convolution is equal to zeta times mu is equal to delta, which is like the neutral element. Okay. So now I can present a bit more clearly what is this open problem or what was this open problem in free probability. So we consider a multiplicative function on partition permutations. Multiplicative just means that you, this guy, you can build it from like um, easier types of partition permutations. In particular, you can just build them as products of uh, a function evaluated at partition permutations where the partition is just one big block. And then this guy will only depend on the conjugacy class of gamma. This is what I mean by multiplicative function. Then we consider these quantities over here when we take these, these building blocks. And this is uh, well-defined. I mean, in the sense that this will only depend on the length of these cycles here because this only depends on the conjugacy class of, of gamma. Okay, then uh, we take uh, certain moments on our higher order probability space. 
And then the free cumulants can be defined just as taking the moments and taking convolution with mu. And this is equivalent to saying uh, that the moments are related to the cumulants with convolution with zeta. And convolution with zeta can actually be seen as sum over non-crossing partition permutations. Okay. And this makes the connection to first order free probability. Because in first order free probability, you express moments are equal to sum over uh, non-crossing partitions of a number of what are called the free cumulants. So, okay, this notion of uh, partition permutations is uh, necessary to go to higher order free probability. And this is what they did in this, in this paper. So, okay, you can encode the moments and the cumulants into generating series. Now the open problem is what is the functional relation between these moments and these cumulants? Okay, so this was solved for n equal to one in the free probability uh, context by Voiculescu, really at the very beginning of uh, free probability. This is this type of functional relations are called R transform machinery because he first found this relation through this uh, R transform generating series. And in this paper by Collins, Mingos, Nyadish, Parker, in which they introduced higher order free probability, um, they also managed to prove this R transform machinery, so this functional relations for n equal to two. But then their proof is very difficult to generalize for higher n. And then uh, what we did with Gaetan is we introduced these combinatorial objects to try to study this problem from a different perspective. So we reproved their formulas for n equal to one and two. It was not very difficult. And then for n equal to three, we get it for free from topological recursion, but for higher n, what happens? And this is what we did in the last work that I will comment just in the last minute. So in the last minutes, I will just show you how the moment cumulant relations look like, but without giving many more uh, um, hints on the proof or anything. So, okay, let's just review a bit what we saw. We consider a higher order probability space. So it's given by an algebra and a certain collection of moments. One can define the free cumulants like this. Then this gives us a notion of freeness that generalizes perfectly the notion uh, in first order. So two, uh, so certain collection of algebras are called free if the mixed cumulants, so if here you see two guys appearing to, um, two guys uh, appearing that belong to two different algebras, these mixed cumulants are called, uh, will be equal to zero. So as classical cumulants, uh, these free cumulants linearize now adding free variables. Uh, classical cumulants linearize adding independent variables, free cumulants linearize adding free variables. Okay, so what we did in our work is we extended all this. As I said before, we extended the multiplication as just this without the planarity condition. This, uh, I don't have uh, time to give the details of this example, but this is just considering one partition permutation, another one, and here we take the product. And here you see that the planar condition is satisfied. So you can model everything as certain surfaces in which you don't see any genus appearing. If you break this, by changing something a little bit. For example, here we put a different partition that puts together these two cycles. Then you are forced to introduce some kind of notion that you can uh, identify nicely with genus, and you can represent these objects with something called surfaced permutations. Okay, then we consider this extended multiplication, this extended convolution using the extended multiplication, also extended zeta and Möbius function, and now these guys will have cor corrections given by h bar. h bar keeps track of now how many crossings you have introduced. So how how what is your genus? And this all together brings us to a notion of uh, gn freeness. So Voiculescu introduced first order freeness. Then Collins, Mingos, and Spiker introduced second order freeness and higher n, but they didn't manage to study it we managed to introduce any GN freeness and we studied all the properties and it turns out that they behave very nicely. This is what happened in this last work. For example, if you take two random, um, two ensembles of random matrices, and uh, one is unitary invariant and they are independent for fixed uh, finite N. If you take the limits when N goes to infinity and they exist at two order GN, then we can prove that the limits are free 
up to order Tn. This was an important result of Voiculescu for first order. Then they studied it that uh, you can generalize it to second order, so you can understand the fluctuations of random matrices. Now, with this result, you can, uh, um, you can keep track of all the corrections of all orders of the random matrices. OK, so I want to finish by presenting the main result. What are these moment free cumulant relations? And then the rest is a bit, uh, this is a bonus, and this is just uh, some uh, questions on future work. So this, uh, this is very fast and this we can skip, but I just want to at least present the main result, how these formulas look like. So, okay, for that, uh, we need uh, um, certain bicolor trees. In these trees, we consider white vertices that are labeled from one to N. They have valences given by these numbers fixed here. And the black vertices, they don't have, uh, they cannot be of degree one. They cannot, they cannot have univalent black vertices. OK, why am I writing 0n here? OK, because I will present the relation just for genus 0, which is the, the most important case for free probability. And just for simplicity, because uh, this is already a bit intricate, seeing it directly for higher genus is a bit crazy. So that's why here I write g0n, and that's why these guys are trees. Otherwise, you will have to consider maps. You have to consider, sorry, uh, graphs with certain cycles. OK, we also consider the weight of every white vertex. It will be a differential operator of a certain order indicated here, acting on a certain variable, and that it only involves uh, generating series of first order cumulus. OK, then uh, this guy is just uh, for each black vertex is the subset of white vertices that connect to it. But this will be easier to see in one example. And this is how the formula looks like in general. So we take xi equal to wi over the generating series of cumulants. And so in this side of the, of the equation, you have just x's. On the other side, you have just w's. And they are related by this. The moments can be expressed as sum over all possible non-negative r's, then all possible sum over all possible trees with these conditions. Then we take products of these operators, one of one for each white vertex that go from one to n. And then here you just have generating series of cumulants. Um, yeah, this you will see very well in an example, but let me just comment on this prime. This prime just means that uh, all the Cs, they will just be themselves, but C2 should be replaced with C2 plus these guys. And this is actually a very intriguing feature it's kind of uh, very natural from the topological recursion point of view. But in general, it's very intriguing what these guys are doing. And there are many cancellations. And it's a bit crazy if you try to understand it combinatorially, for example. OK, let me give an example to understand a bit better. So we can give uh, one of these trees for n equal to 7. It has uh, vertices labeled from 1 to 7 like this. Then black vertices uh, between them, because it has to be bicolored. And then in here, this is forbidden. Then what are the weights? So the weights work like this. So for every black vertex, we put here, if the degree is 4, we put C4. And then we put the variables that correspond, that carry the labels of the vertices around it. And then if the, if the vertex is of degree 2, you just add this correction. This is just how it works. So the weight for this tree is of this shape. OK, um, so I'm uh, a bit short on time, but let me just say very briefly that this uh, I, I made here some remarks to tell you that there are a finite amount of trees for every n fixed. So for example, for 0, 3, you can think a little bit that the only possible valences that are allowed are these, uh, these over here. So you, only, you can only have, I mean, you all, all, always have these three white vertices that are uh, numerated. And then you can only have either these trivalent uh, black vertex or these bivalent possibilities. OK, then uh, here is another comment to say that the contributions coming from O will also stop for a fixed R, the contributions for M. Uh, so the, the sum will never go farther than R. Otherwise, the contributions are 0. This uh, you can check easily with the formula. So the sums on the right-hand side are finite. This works. And let me show how it works for this example. So at least you have 
an idea of how it looks for zero three, that is an important case. So in this case, the weight for this tree is just this guy. The weights for these other three are just products of these two, the contributions for these two edges. I mean, these two black vertices, sorry. And then these O's uh, only appear for zero and one. They are of this shape. Let me skip the details. And then here you have the moment cumulant formulas for zero three. This is M3. And here you see that only cumulant generating series are appearing. So, okay, let me just uh, finish very briefly with um, uh, a bit what, what we did. So to prove the moment cumulant relations in free probability, we actually proved those relations for any genus, um, for any genus, and we specialize it to genus equal to zero. This uh, allowed us to uh, find a theory of uh, um, higher order freeness in which you also take into account the higher genus corrections. The idea of the proof is what I already said. We show that our master relation is equivalent to this uh, guy that is what appears as the definition of free cumulants in free probability. We showed this using Fox space formalism. And finally, we show the moment cumulant relations for any uh, surfaced free probability problem. Okay, and here are some uh, future and ongoing uh, uh, work, some possible questions. What would be other meaningful problems in which this um, uh, master relation appears? Because now it seems to be uh, something very general. One instance is constellations in which applying the relation forgets one color. What are the consequences in free probability? What is exactly the relation with topological recursion? Because we didn't really use topological rec recursion for this master relation, but it's very, it seems to be very related, at least in the ca case of maps. And we also have some other evidence. Can this help understanding the, the nature of symplectic invariance of topological recursion? Can we extend to this, this to the orthogonal, real, or non-orientable, depending on which setting you are? This seems uh, reasonable. Maybe the topological recursion site is still to be developed. Is there a combinatorial proof of this? There is some ongoing work of Luca Leoni on this. And uh, uh, I also talked recently to Zuber, who's working on counting partitions of genus G. His motivation was to also interpolate between classical and free probability. So it seems to be related to his problem. So thank you very much for your attention.